I'm pleased to let me think what is the date it's the 11th of October 1995 I'm in Lahore I'm speaking to Alice Fares mm -hmm. how did a well brought up middle class Leighton girl get involved in the communist party yes that's a strange thing because my parents were uh, uh, conservatives but they weren't sort of die hard conservatives it was just that they like they liked to go to the club and they met nice people and they were business people so <coughs> but they were never against our taking part in any uh, doubtful politics as they would call them oh dear and I used to wonder I think I told you that before and there was a huge um, did you have your water? No, I'll have you have it. Huh? I'll have you have this one. So I joined it. Joined the procession. And then I became a member of the party from my local branch. So take part in May Day, May Day processions and so on. And then I expanded. I... Um, found my way to Clerkenwell, where the Communist Party headquarters were. Hmm? Not headquarters, London headquarters. And um, I, I just went in and heard a lecture there, so I thought, yes, I've done the right thing. I hadn't signed as a member in Leighton, but I told them I will become a member of the, of the Communist Party. And I became a member from Clark and when. Of course, there were a lot of Indians then. But, but when was this? Say 46? Or... No, I'm begging your pardon. 36, yes. Yeah. Spanish Civil War. Yeah, I marched with Stephen Spender and so on, these people, yes. And you were saying there were Indians in the party? Uh, yes. Iqbal Singh, Mukhraj Anand and people like that but they they were really from the they really were a writer's batch and uh, then we became friends and um, we met quite often and my friendship with the um, with the Indians and my sisters has sort of expanded and we went to their meetings and the Progressive Writers Association was formed in <coughs> was formed in um, London. Oh, God. And, um, well, they were at Cambridge. So many Indians were at Cambridge. And so many were just freelance political people, freelance writers. So um, we knew so many people there. And um, particularly we used to join in the May Day processions and any other demonstration. Hmm? Because the black shirts were at that time, growing uh, dangerous. And they used, on two, two occasions, they attacked the um, May Day processions. But what was the motivation? Why the Communist Party? What was the attraction of communism for you at that time? For me? I believe I was a progressive from the beginning. I was always uh, certain that um, what can I say that the world is wrong and um, and if one cho chose a political path there should be a path to put things right try to anyway and um, no I believed in what I was doing there's no doubt about it I wanted to go to Spain of course but my parents said no not for any particular reason, but just that we wouldn't like you to go. You might get killed or something, because that famous um, poem, poet had been killed then. What was his name? John Conflict. Yeah, John, yes, he had just died. And um, other people we knew had um, been killed too. Uh, I know people like Patience Sedney, who was in the party, who went as a nurse to, to Spain. Yes, I knew the name, yes. Mm. 
You knew her. Uh, and she's, st she's still, uh, at least as, a, as of a couple of years ago, alive and kicking and politically active in London. Really? Yeah. She stayed in the party till almost the end of the party. It's amazing of the people who joined in that generation, a lot stayed with the party, a lot left, of course, but a lot mm. stayed with the party. Well, um, then... Uh, <coughs> <coughs> of course, when I came, um, oh dear, <coughs> <coughs> there was a paper called Infracor. Did you ever see it? International Press. I've heard about it. Mm. And it used to be um, printed and uh, sort of secretly. And um, I was chosen to see that um, some, of, some of the copies got to um, India. So I was working then for one of the directors in W. H. Smith and & Son, and I used to send it under cover of their you know, envelopes. You used to send Communist International Literature in your W. H. Uh, Smith's uh, envelope? Yeah. Silly, wasn't it, to put in a newspaper? Anyway, it was discovered because um, all the posts was opened. I had to send it to the south, I think it was, um, oh, which was the name of the town. Anyway, it had to go, and many got through, but then this one was found, and uh, it was investigated, and they discovered it was my typewriter. my boss called me he was a very fine person he was an engineer and he was working on continuous stationery which was something that sounded rather stupid but he was very keen on that so he called me and said um, you know or asked me was this my typewriter or did I do this I said yes why did you do this? This is a highly inflammatory newspaper. Uh, yeah, yeah. I said, yes, but I, that, I, I work for them because I believe in them. So then uh, Eklund was the name of the owner of Dwayne Smith and Son. I mean, Lord Eklund, I think he was. So um, he sent for me and said, you are so young and you've got involved in this various activity. Well, I said, you, you <laughs> just get rid of me if you like. He said, no, we value your services here. And um, I like meeting people like you, something like that. So, anyway, I continued in my job. And, um, of course, he said, don't do that kind of thing. You want to send uh, newspapers or things like that to India, there's a terrible risk to the person who receives it and also um, to you. I said, no, I, I do it sort of voluntarily. And, uh, uh, well, uh, if you believe in this kind of thing, you have to take risks. He was very nice. So, yes, and where do we go from here? So how then, once you couldn't use W.H. Smith, how did you get the literature out to India? It was passed on to somebody else who had m m some other contact. Who were you working for in the party then? Were you working for the International Section or actually Palm Dutt? For, well, Palm Dutt was there all the time, and Christian Renan and so on. So you don't ask these questions. You just, <coughs> oh, you just say this... Um, this is a job to be done when you do it. In, in the India office. Door. Leave you there. Door Bernardi. Work for Krishna Menon in the India League. And uh, that was in the Strand, right up a staircase in a little dingy room, you know. And uh, he used to get nice girls to come and type his... Um, envelopes for material he was sending out 
and he used to talk to us about the Communist Party in India and what they were going to do. So it was interesting. Was Krishna Menon a communist? Well, he was with the party. I mean, in the sense that he would do... India League was, I mean, India League. It was for freedom and everything, so... Yeah, he, he, we, we arranged that we should do his work. Typing out documents and sending envelopes out. And, um... He talked to us about a rigorous imprisonment. We misunderstood him. We thought he was saying vigorous imprisonment. So, <laughs> oh, you English girls are so ignorant. <laughs> I said, no, we're not ignorant. I said, it sounds better than rigorous. <laughs> no, we met all kinds of people there whose names now have become shadows. And then, um, Yes, we used to distribute literature to on street corners. Yes, ask questions. Was it exciting? Was it fun? Oh yes, terrific. And because we believed in it. And <coughs> my mother and father knew about it and they had no... Uh, oh yes, I was going to tell you, my father was a businessman in the books and... Um, Eklund knew him, knew of him. They asked, they sort of um, surveyed my um, background before they called me. So they were told that he was one of our, one of, one of W. H. Smith and Sons, very trusted and old customers. So he said, yes, it's because of your father's integrity and so on that we are not going to take action or anything like that. So <laughs> I stayed on. <laughs> And you obviously developed close friendships. Did you, did you get to know people like Palm Dutt in the party headquarters? Well, <clears throat> used to, whenever he, he met me, he used to say, hello, Alice. But I never... The people we knew were mostly writers. Iqbal Singh, Mulkaraj Anand, Kumar Mangan. They were all at Cambridge. Um, Cambridge is a hotbed. And others, too. Who was the most, who was the leading figure among the Indian communists in the UK at that time? Was it Kumar Mangalam? Kumar Mangalam, yes, and, um, uh, <clears throat> I think he was, and, um, Sajaja here, he was a member of the party. Did you know people like Victor Kiernan and Ralph Russell? Dick Kiernan was here. I had a letter from him two or three days back. We still write. He uh, he taught in um, Aitchison College for some time. Married an Indian girl. What's her name. She was in the People's Theatre from Bombay, but it didn't work out. Oh, he's wonderful. <coughs> he lives now in Scotland, in Galashiels. He married a Canadian girl. They're, <coughs> they're not living apart, but, uh, I mean, they, she has things to do, and once she's settled now in Gadda's Shields, he doesn't... He, in his letter, he said, I... Uh, something about, I've lost my energy. <coughs> Somebody invited me down to London. That's about as much as I can do. He's 81, or 82. And you met him at that time in London? Yes, always. Through the Cambridge people. Through uh, Dr. Dacia, who married my sister. And um, we did a lot of things together. Whenever we met, we went to the Indian restaurants. A good meal for one rupee and tuppence. <laughs> Did you know Ralph Russell at that time? Yes, of course. Mm. What was Ralph up to? Uh, <coughs> not to watch. I think he was teaching at the SOS. I think 
so. And then um, gradually he came after Pakistan. He was considered the best um, uh, authority on Urdu and so on. He wrote a book or something. And then he got very friendly with the Pakistan government and did a textbook, I think, for the school or something like that. He stayed with us whenever he came to um, Pakistan. Not in this house, but um, a house in Shimna Bahari, a very lovely flat. So we knew him well. And when, when first, whenever he went to London, he always met him. How did you make the leap from being involved in the CP and in the Indian League to coming to travel to India? To see my sister. She was already married here in Amritsar, and he was teaching in the MEO College, Muslim Mangalore Indian College. And... Uh, <coughs> By that time, they had a child of them, Sam, who was two years old. I came for a holiday, really, and uh, I had met some of the people <coughs> who used to come to Amritsar. So I'd met them in London. No, I was, um, I knew what it would be like coming here, <coughs> where it was Amritsar then. Amritsar was a, then I started teaching in an Indian school in the city in Amritsar. <laughs> it was mostly six. And, uh, <coughs> and then the uh, students claimed me also for work with them. The, the Indian students. This is from 1939? Yes, after the war. After the war I started. Fez and I knew each other then, and uh, we, the Tassiers always used to go to Kashmir for their summer vacation. And that year, <coughs> Fez had made up his mind to go to Cambridge, and he was, he was certain there would be a war. So he said, I might not go, but I, I don't think anything will stop me now. His mother, the, his mother wanted to get him out of my clutches. <laughs> or oh, they became good friends afterwards. <laughs> and um, we were in Kashmir and Fez came up to say goodbye. And then outside the um, club in uh, Gulberg, the notice had appeared, war has been declared. And they were, he said, I don't go. I said, no, you should go. But he said, no. I won't go. I'd stay here. There'd be plenty of things to do here. It was then that the Communist Party decided that all their good people, he was never a member of the party, but he was with, you know, a close contact, that they should go into the army. They were asked to join the writing side because Calcutta had been attacked by that time and they wanted progressives to be in the um, in uniform, soldiers in uniform, and to get to know the um, whatever progressives they could find in the British and American army. He used to take evening classes on Marxism. When you came out, were you doing any party work? Not sort of here. When meeting students, yes, and talking to students. Just that I, I shouldn't expose myself to that extent, they thought. But we were, the students knew, and we were all progressives in that sense. Then I did some broadcasting from Delhi also, students at, um, students at, at, students at the barricades, with some students and some sympathizers, talking about the war and so on and so forth. No, I was pretty busy. And then I, after that, I got married. Where did you meet Fez? You met Fez in Amritsar? Mm. How did you meet Fez? At Dasya's house. He used to have gatherings of poets and so on every week. 
and he used to come from the hall to Amritsa. And they used to stay the night, you know, throw um, beddings on the floor, music going on the whole night long. It was rather lovely. And what was the main bond between you? Was it uh, politics? I think so, yes. Knowing that we liked each other, but there was no question of explaining each other to each other. That's what real friends are by at last, if you don't have to explain yourself. But how come then two communists got married uh, by Sheikh Abdullah and Trinidad? Well, he wasn't the Sheikh Abdullah he, that he is now. He was loved by the people, don't you think so? Mm -hmm. They looked towards him for freedom. When he was in, when he came, when he was in Gulbarg, Gulmarg, um, you see people coming from the mountains, from the hills, all converging towards where he was. Then you could see him sit down to them, and he would talk to them. He was a real leader of his people. Hmm. He was loved by his people. Things have changed. The whole thing has changed now. And he married you. He performed the Nikah, yes. Well, Forty-one. In what, what about us? In one of the Rani's palaces. Because um, my brother-in-law had been appointed the <coughs> principal of, of the biggest college there. And uh, the Maharaja, they had no, no uh, house for us. So he lent the, um, his palace for the time being, one of the Rani's palaces. So we lived there, and, um, and that's where we were married. Rather strange mix that you were married in a Rani's palace mm -hmm. by the leader of the Kashmiri Liberation Movement. Amazing, isn't it? In those wartime years, the CPI's line towards partition kept changing against it, for it, against it. Did that cause a great deal of anguish to you and face? Not really, because on the question of partition must always be, because it's an unknown, uh, unknown quantity. What's going to happen? You don't know. You didn't expect what did happen. But um, I think Fez in the end um, saw that there was no alternative, that there had to be partition because of the strength of the, of the um, right-wing Hindus and because of the, um, the feudals in... Um, the, amongst the Muslims, it had to be. It's the only way in which they could both survive. I wish it hadn't come about now, because... I, I don't know whether uh, India as such could have survived. What do you think? Unless it was a, unless it was a progressive socialist state, that's the only way it could have could have survived without division. Fais wrote that tremendously powerful poem, which is one of his best known poems, Freedom's Dawn, about the disappointment. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Mm. What was in his mind then? I think what he said that the the progressives would have to go would st stand no chance. And they didn't, because the party itself was divided. And then this Hindu-Muslim question had grown so strong then, even amongst progressives. But the poem seems to be a poem against partition, when in fact he was in favour of it. That's what I say. It is difficult to make decisions, very difficult, to make sort of cut and dried you're always in the grey area, not knowing what's going to happen. 
I wish, I wish it hadn't taken place, of course. Neither, neither countries really benefited. emotions do you think um, at the time of independence what I and mean, how did first feel about August the 14th, August the 15th 1947 he was sorry I think that it had to take place but then I, I think as things were going he saw that it, it would and it had to there were so many strong uh, feelings in favour of it. Did he see it as freedom? Hmm? Did he see it as freedom, independence? The first step towards freedom, towards a free India, yes. That people could think in terms of freedom. And he had no doubt that he would come to Pakistan? Oh, no, of course not. He belongs to Punjab, Sierra Court. And then, um, of course, Min of the Kharakleen, who owned the, who was starting the Pakistan Times, came to Delhi where we were and uh, asked him to take it over. I mean, would he be the first editor? And Fez said, well, I've never done that kind of political uh, journalism. He said, and I think you're the only one that can do it now. So thus began the Pakistan Times. And this, 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 this has it ended. At the time of partition, where were you in August 1947? Delhi. How did you get out? We came with Bukhari. You know Bukhari, who was the principal of government college. We didn't own very much. I think we came we came by train and we landed up in a hotel which is no longer there and then Bukhari offered half of his house he was principal then of government college but mirrored me and Kharuddin he thought that that would not be good for Pedro's name he doesn't think you should, we should share a house with him. So he found us a house. Which was her upper story of his, one of his relatives, Bingham Shranawas. We stayed there. Then we moved into another evacuee house. Then finally we moved into a flat opposite what was the radio station then <clears throat> and stayed there until the end of Pakistan. You went from Delhi to Lahore in one journey? Or was, it, was it to Lahore you came? Yes. At that time the, 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 all, obviously we heard all the stories about those railway journeys. <coughs> no, we came and <coughs> we came before August. We came in February. <coughs> so that's how there was no problem. No. You were in August nineteen forty seven then you were 
were already in Lahore. In Lahore, yes. Mm. How was Lahore at that time? Sort of some impending something. I mean, people knew that they didn't think that what did happen would happen. And I think nobody was really preparing <coughs> to leave. They thought that they could both live together. And all over the Punjabs, Sikhs and Hindus were not, of course, um, agriculturists. The uh, Sikhs and the Muslims were living well together, happy together still keeping their particular tradition and so on apart. But nobody thought that would happen. How much of the violence in the war did you see yourself? Well, my mother and father were... ...in-law had found a house, and they went there. You had to take over the evacuee house and be registered by the, uh, uh, what should I say, what's it called? Evacuee property, something like that. So he had a house, he went there. And then affairs was in um, Lahore. They were in Kashmir. Then, I mean, the, she went, this is how we went. I went, first of all, down to Murray with two children. And my mother and father had a truck from Surinigar down to Lahore with all the, with one Muslim servant. Because on the way you didn't know whether you'd meet Muslims hostile or Hindu hostile. There are many cases, you see, of even on that road of people being murdered, assassinated, and so on. So they came down to Lahore, and uh, <coughs> of course they were horrified. They just couldn't understand what was happening. And so they stayed with my brother-in-law, and then we came down to marry because the younger girl had had whooping cough and it was still hot in the hall or it was, would, would be hot so we stayed in a hotel there then Fez came up to take us down and friends there, Muslim friends were saying we should let us look after them and so on so Fez said no we should go back to the hall now and then we went into a <coughs> hotel and then this Bukhari business started. But we, then my mother and father decided to go leave Lahore or leave Pakistan because um, even uh, Westerners were not um, safe either. So they left for South Africa. I had two brothers there by, tra by train. And stayed in South Africa, very, very unhappy. My brother had, of course my brother was the top ranking bureaucrat in government house and so on. One was, the other one was not like that. He was a sort of gentle socialist. Am I doing something I shouldn't be doing? No, 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 no. I'm just predicting. Don't worry. <laughs> so, uh, my uh, mother and father were put in the new house. You know, and tutor, not to mention they were coming from Pakistan and so on and so forth. That's how it was. And, um, then they spent, and they were so shocked, they used to, they, my brother bought a car especially for them with a black chauffeur. And he, they were instructed not to speak to the 
to the chauffeur unless it was necessary. And um, so that made it all very unhappy. But they enjoyed it, seeing their grandchildren and so on and so forth. And traveling was in their blood. But when you got back to Lahore, was Lahore and Khan at all the trouble of Lahore finished? Oh no. Train loads of and train loads of dead were still coming through from dead Muslims from um, what was now in India and here they were from here they were going six and Patoki was a famous massacre and Fez wrote an editorial on that a wonderful editorial and he sent his, um, he went, his um, cartoonist, who is still alive and well, was caught up in one of the uh, camps. <coughs> so he went to India and brought him back. It's the kind of thing he did. And the cartoonist, is, what's the cartoonist's name? Hmm? What is the cartoonist's name? Anwar. Anwar. He's, he still, he's still uh, alive and well. Oh yes, he's going to give um, a lecture on cartooning on the 15th in Shaka Ali Museum. <clears throat> what was the atmosphere in the hall at that time? Oh, uh, still massacres and fear and people trying to get away. The house that we, we, were, we were in in Shimna Pahari, the upper story, the Zultana's <coughs> 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 um, family had been downstairs, so they took over the downstairs, and so we took over the upper flat. And then um, stayed there until Fez went to prison. And he came back to that house after prison, so it was rather nice. And that, now I've gone to after partition. Was that, was that an area which was affected by the disturbances, or was that area quiet in Pakistan? When all the houses that have been um, owned by Hindus or lived in were all full of refugees, all our quarters in our place where we were doing were full of refugees. And then Minister Khardin was the um, Minister for uh, Refugees or something, it was a special name for it. And um, he allowed the man in whose house flat we were living to take away his stuff. And uh, there was quite a riot in the quarters that you have um, allowed this man to come and take away all his stuff. Should have given it to us. As it's not mine to give, it's his. Anyway, he took away, he gave some things to me, a sewing machine, which I gave to the people in the quarter, and some toys, which I also gave. And then he, he took away, did I, was it you I told? No. He said my father, uh, I had, Mr. George, he told my father, I got a surprise for you because you've been so good. Uh, if you can open this um, uh, sideboard cover uh, door, you'll find a lot of whiskey in it. So we managed to open it, it was empty. <laughs> and he said, I have to investigate my wife's saris. She said, bring, she'll be sure to bring them all. We went into the, the, the bedroom. <clears throat> where they were, my mother and father were opened it, they were all gone but we know who took them because the people who lived in the flat before we went in we knew them so they were, so they were, they were there was nobody between them and partition so we knew who had taken them but I was sorry because you know there was a sort of feeling that 
and mistrust the rules in other ways. He owned a big um, oil um, garage, big one, you know, and the man downstairs had been a well-known doctor and the garden was strewn with beds and medicines and everything. I mean, it was all very sad. And when we were looking for a place to live, we went to many houses along with the rehabilitation people and they had desecrated, I mean, the, all the religious, religious rooms of the six had been defiled and so on. I mean, the, it, was, um, it was very sad. And uh, I think there was still isolated killing going on, in particularly in model town. How long after independence did first write Freedom's Dawn? Isn't it dated? Uh, the, poem, the book of poems, I think, is dated from the 19, early 1950s. Uh, <coughs> The book, of, the book of Poems is from 1952, it appeared in 1952, but did he write it in 1952 or did he write it shortly after independence? Oh, I think he must have written it, <coughs> I think, uh, <coughs> just after, I think I report Salima's laryngitis, just after partition. He calls it this leftless daybreak. Mm. It's just a feeling of great sadness. Yeah, of course it does. <coughs> Not that clear dawn in quest of which these comrades set out. What was the dawn he was looking for? Dawn of freedom. As one supposed it. Either a division which was calm and peaceful, or else no division at all. <coughs> Do you like these translations? I like uh, Victor's, yes, but I'm also very glad there's a literal translation as well, because yes. sometimes a little bit of the meaning is lost with the the translation into verse form. Yes, 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 that is true. In fact, the best ones, I think, are those which are not done in verse form. And he says at the end, let us go on, our goal is not reached yet. What do you think he thought the goal was? Well, socialist state, obviously. <laughs> Or a democratic state, we should say. Not as we were ruled by laws, feudal laws, and so on. Did he still think socialism was possible in 47? Did he still think? Socialism was possible here in 1947. Oh, I think a socialist always thinks a socialist is possible sometime. Not at that stage, but... The fact that freedom had come, that you had sort of shaken off the shackles, meant a lot. But what was Peter's mood in August 1947? Was he excited? Very, very sad. I find him a sort of, not brooding, but he never brooded. And I remember I asked him once, well, what, are, what is now wrong with you? He said, my country has been torn asunder. I think that's how he felt. Because of the death and destruction and rape and everything. In fact, so many friends had gone, had to go, leaving everything that they had.
You re- did you come in contact? No, probably with those hundred people who went from <coughs> Pakistan to India? Yes. Mm. Just a few months ago. Yeah. When on the 10th and 11th of November, I think, is they're coming here. But I think <coughs> there's a bit of a... They had a meeting a few days ago. We had a meeting in the office, so I couldn't go. But I think the Indian government may or may not issue visas because we are not particularly our friendly at the moment. Did, even after 47, did people have any realization how long a scar petition would leave in relations between the two countries? Well, I think they did. This India Pakistan is is like uh, well, it's like Palestine and Israel. I don't think it will ever be cleared up. Not, I mean, maybe something will happen. And yet, if there were, we, uh, Pakistan would be the losers, wouldn't they? That's what worries Pakistan, because India is a much more powerful country, industrialized, and worldwide known, and so on. <coughs> and um, Pakistan has committed so many blunders. I can't cough properly because my when I was hurt in my eight months. Um. Yes, I know. And I'm um. smoker, passive smoker, right. because my husband was there. Right. Mm. And my father, so that's been with me all my life. We're now recording. To read some of the Western newspapers, when Imran Khan brings his bride here, mm-hmm. she's going to be locked up in a miserable, dirty city, not free to do anything she wants, a prisoner. Is Who told you that? Right, it's what I've read in the papers. No. You, is, is it true? Of course it's not. No, no, it isn't true. It depends upon the, the family. It's a very enlightened family, and he's got um, sisters, I think, who are professional girls working and so on. And he himself, I mean, he, he may have turned Muslim in that sense, but he wouldn't um, uh, sort of do anything like that. No. You've known this city for more than half a century. Mm, a half a century, yes. You, you've lived here mm. as the foreign bride of mm-hmm. local. How difficult did you find it at first to adjust? Well, <clears throat> you see, we knew a lot of Indians in London. We, I was working with the um, in, uh, the um, Indians for the freedom of, um, you know, and I was working with Krishna Menon and that kind of person. So we knew a lot about it. We knew a lot about India and conditions. And um, when I came here, the reason why we delayed our marriage was because my mother-in-law and her family, they were a little, well, they didn't quite want us to be married. But um, afterwards, um, I think I didn't have any trouble. Is there any advice you would give to somebody like Jemima who is coming to live here that's not perhaps quite knowing what she's going to, to find here? Be yourself. Be kind. Don't be critical. Um learn the language as soon as you can so as Fez told me otherwise you think you, people are talking about you but uh, <laughs> I learned uh, Udo as quickly as possible and I had a tutor as well she should learn to speak in Udo as quickly as possible and um, wear, wear the native dress because that's what every anybody who comes here does that even if they're just uh, just uh, visitors and they always wear the native dress because people here don't like to see legs and arms and so on and so forth. They're not used to them. So, no, she should be herself. She should be kind and understanding and realize that all the dirt and the filth was created by the British when they... <laughs> I mean, in that sense, it's, 
it's post-colonial, isn't it? Let's face it. So, I think if she wants to accept it, it'll be all right. And it's up to um, Imran also. He's got a nice father, nice sisters. I don't know why she shouldn't be happy. She'll find um, a lot of um, problems regarding sanitation and so on and so forth. That's up to her to make her house livable, and they'll have plenty of money, so she'll be able to do it. What do you think she'll find the biggest shock comparing life in prosperous Richmond to life in the war? Well, there's a poor Britain also, you mustn't forget that. Very poor Britain. Um, I think sanitation and things like that, cleanliness, you'll find that a problem. Adjusting to that. And adjusting to poverty. Adjusting to poverty all around her. In the worst possible form. Particularly children and child labour and things like that. She'll have to adjust to that. She can't start criticising these things. But they belong to an infrastructure which has eventually to change. So... As a woman, how restrictive would she find it? Would she be able to mix uh, socially? Would she be able to shop by herself? Well, she'll shop in a car with a driver, and uh, there are plenty of shops which cater for ladies like us, you know, the superstores and so on, and they'll, they'll get to know her, so her shopping be no problem. She'll find anything that she wants there that is either smuggled in or brought in. No problem to buy things. And, um, no, she won't live the kind of life that people think she will. She'll lead the upper-class life. And she'll be very comfortable, very happy. What about parties? Um, yes, there'll be parties. She won't be able to drink. But um, I suppose uh, Imran will see that the parties that he runs or the parties that are run for him don't have drinks around. But um, she can mix, yes. People will want to see her mix with her and so on. But she, uh, I, my life was different. My husband was a writer. And, um, well, uh, I, it was understood that his friends were male friends. And not many of them, none of them brought their wives along to parties. And if they did come, they sat aside with me. But I, I accepted that. And I made a lot of friends like that, you see. But um, there is, there's less mixing now because the mullahs are sort of raising their voices. But um, it's up to the family what kind of party you have. I get the impression, just from talking to you, that you really rather enjoy your life in Lahore, and you think that she would probably enjoy her life here as well. I think she will, yeah. I don't enjoy it now, of course, without fairs, because I... So many of my friends have passed away too, which is very, very sad, very sad. And so I live, I live here alone. My daughter lives there, and my lovely grandson has gone off for four years for medicine, and um, she's very busy. She is in television. Her husband is a um, professor, and then the other daughter around here, she's principal of an arts college, and her. Daughter is just going off now to do her three years filmmaking, she's chosen. And her, her son is in Montreal at McGill. He's doing, um, what do you call it, psychiatry and so on. So the family is sort of now scattering. So I just um, lead my life as I want to. I, I work three days a week at the Human Rights Commission three mornings a week. The rest, I think, I deserve. I deserve to rest, that's all. If, if Jemima came to you for advice when she settled here and she says, look, I've got a British passport, should I keep it or should I become a Pakistani national? What would you, what would you advise? She can have two, I think. She can have two passports. And um, I think Imran and she should sort that out. It's not my decision. It's the decision between those two. I think she should have two passports. I didn't. For so one thing, my mother said, keep your British passport. You know, she's such a dear. And then um, I, I asked the, uh, Brit the Brits here also, and they said you'll lo lose certain advantages if you have only a Pakistani passport or if you have both, pas both passports. They said keep your British passport. And then something very funny happened. I had an invitation to go somewhere. Where was it? 
and uh, the, the security refused to let me go. So um, uh, I went to the British High Commission and I said, this is the situation, and I want a passport. Um, I want to revert to my British passport, so I want to go to this international seminar. He said, that's all right, Mrs. Fares. But, he said, then I thought something was coming. He said, tomorrow is Saturday, then comes Sunday. You won't have it on Monday. You know, that was his one. <laughs> so I said, that's all right. <laughs> so I, after that, I didn't sort of chop and change. Then um, they have given me a passport, British passport, because now we have to register with the police. That was a sort of, um, because the um, Pakistanis did something also, so the, the Brits also said you have to have a um, register. So um, I told the, uh, the, the uh, um, what is it, the um, Pakistani security, I'm not going to register with the police. I'm not, you can arrest me, you can do anything you like. I'm not going to register with the police. So that came in the print. Mrs. Thurs refuses to register with the police. <laughs> so anyway, it was sorted out. And they gave me um, um, a visa for the length of my passport. And I just reviewed, I had just renewed my passport. So it's all right. It runs out this year. But uh, I don't intend to travel anymore. If, if uh, Imran's bride is a bit homesick and wants company of other British nationals, is there an expatriate community here? Uh, yes. There's an American association, there's a British association. You see, all the women who are married to Pakistanis have, um, we have something on it, X or Y, something to, um, to uh, uh, sort of determine that we are not sort of... Um, all there, we have a Pakistani husband. And this organization was fighting to have that removed. And I'm not sure whether they, because I was not interested in that. There are lots of nice people for her to meet. But um, she wouldn't have any problems. You've been here right from before partition, right down to the present. You've, been, you've witnessed the events which written two books so you put, you've seen the war never in different countries mm. what do you think about partition from this vantage point do you feel it's a tragedy or do you think it's something that was in this is my personal opinion my husband used to say there was no alternative because the um, Muslim and Hindu situation was such that um, probably the uh, Muslims would have become not a minority, but an unfortunate um, group. He he thought it was the right thing. But I didn't. Because if um, if the India and Pakistan had become a socialist country, that would have been ideal. But um, couldn't become that. And then you see, the, as he was right, the richest people here were the Hindus. And the Muslims were, were not. No, I think it. Um, I think it had to be, but as it's turned out now, well, I don't know where we are heading. The, the worst thing is the fundamentalism. That's what's going to drag us down, I think. If partition was inevitable, was the violence which accompanied it inevitable? Yes, nobody anticipated that. They didn't anticipate the fact that there was so much hatred because um, in, in our own village, in Fez's village, Hindus were living within a stone's throw and all over that area, Sikhs and Hindus and Muslims were living side by side, cheek by jowl. And, and uh, nobody thought that would happen. Nobody thought it would happen. With the rape and the murder and everything, nobody thought it. When did you first get a feeling that there was this violence in the air? Was there any incident? That made you realise how deep the hatred was. Oh yes, because I was in I was in Lahore, and the trains were coming with nothing but bodies, dead bodies. I mean, and um, we were in Kashmir. My mother and father were there. They come came for six months, and they went uh, travelling round. And we said that uh, nobody will be safe, so they had um, 
better get out. So we hired a truck and they, I went down to Murray and they came down to La Hogue. And they were told that um, you better have something to cover yourself. I mean, people were frightened. That's when I first got the idea. And then from Murray, there were a lot of six there. And they wanted to get to La Hogue and onwards. And uh, we we said, yes, we'll hire the Lara. There were a group of our people. We were, we were very jolly, goodbye, we'll come and visit you and so on and so forth. Don't worry. And uh, they were massacred on the way down before they got to Robert Bindi. We gave them water and food and everything and they were massacred. How do you know they were massacred? Oh, well, I mean, the, the Patans came down from the hills and... The people came screaming and said the, 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 the gutters running with blood and we went down there. If every woman and, they were mostly women and children, they were massacred. Old men and everything. You witnessed something, seeing they happen. I mean, I went there and I, we, we knew they were massacred. I mean, it's, um, and they were because the batons came from the hills. I mean, it's, it's a known fact. They didn't get to Robert Bindi. That's what I first, that's when I first thought. And then we had to get to the hall. Uh, myself and the children and um, another woman who's married to a Pakistani and we. So we put on burqas and carried Qurans because we were in Pakistan to get down to the hall. Then I realized that it was, um, you know, and, uh, murder and then the reports came and so on and so forth and Fez went uh, to um, he went to India to the camps there to rescue somebody and he came and told us and, and then there was a place here not called Patoki there was a terrible massacre chasing the women through the streets of Patoki he wrote an editorial on it. Were you shocked by the extent of the sexual violence during the I was, yes, I was. I hadn't come across that. I was. I was. And some of the women were taken away, of course, and never heard of again. Some of the Muslim women. There have been many stories written about. There was a film made, wasn't there, about that also. No, it was a madness afoot. Terrible. One doesn't know how many people died, really. But that, and it's, and it's not history either. It's not history because these uh, confrontations are still going on in India, as you know. As you know. So to say it's history, it isn't history. It's a running thing, like the Israelis and the um, Palestinians. And look what's happening in um, Bosnia and with the Serbs. Who would have thought of that? Who would have thought of that? I would never have thought of that. They were living next door to each other. So one doesn't know where, what the depth of this hatred and religious hatred and others. One doesn't know how deep it is and when it will ever end and how you can end it. Let me, if I may, ask you one last question. It's one of those impossible questions, but let me ask you. In India, the left is still strong. The yes, Congress parties in the uh, Calcutta and everywhere. Yeah. In Pakistan, that whole progressive left tradition mm. seems to be derailed. What, what went wrong? Why no left in Pakistan? Well, I think that... Um, I suppose it's something to do with Islam also. Why, why institutionally didn't the left survive? Why is there no Pakistan Communist Party worth anything? There were several. That's the whole thing. There was never one really strong. There were, you see, I think that um, in, in India, the Communist Party really was in um, Bengal, that area, the strong, strength of it there. And it survived, it's still there. But there are so many left intellectuals who were, became Pakistanis, and yet... The, the left, Not many. INA veterans, uh, people connected with the progressive movement in the, in the widest form. Not really. No, 
they were in India. P- people like Mulkarajanand and Sajjad here, and he said they were in India. And then you see, I, I think it was something to do with Islam as well. There is the, because Hindus, the progressive writers, were never strong on their religion. Whereas the Muslims were, it was a sort of conflict, I think. No, then. I think that the strongest remained there. So Islam squeezed out political ideology? No, don't say that. I, I, I don't think so, but it, Islam, I think, is stronger. Didn't squeeze it out, it's stronger. And then <clears throat> the pressure from all sides in here has always been religion and Islam. It's coming there also, on the other side. Won't be long before it comes there, and in fact, it's there also. It is to it is to keep out mm, the political life of the people. When you turn to religion, I mean, it is turned to. That's the more profitable for a government. So you want you want to ask some questions in Urdu? Okay. We're now recording a television interview. When you came here as a bride from Britain half a century ago, how difficult was it to adjust to Lahore? Um, well, people were very helpful. That was one thing. And Fez had many, many friends. But there weren't many pe- women, English women, married to Indians there was then. So um, it was more difficult to adjust to the... Um, family than anything else, and to learn the language, and learn to wear the dress properly, <laughs> and um, adjusting to food, climate, everything was difficult. But if you say, well, this is a game for keeps, then you make up your mind to do it, and then you have to do it with grace. And I learned to do it with grace. In those days, perhaps the whole was a more tolerant society. Today, is Islamic fundamentalism is stronger. Will that make life more difficult for the minor? You see, we didn't, um, uh, we didn't uh, mix with um, English people. Fez had a tremendous following of his own uh, writers and so on, but that didn't bother us. But she will um, have to make up her mind, of course, where she wants to live, how she wants to live, the pattern of living. And um, I think it will be difficult. She'll have to make lots of adjustments. I think so. But if she does them with grace and with happiness and sort of makes it look as though she really likes living here, then it'll be all right. But will the strength of Islam, the style of Islam nowadays, make life more difficult, make adjustment more difficult now than in the 40s? Um, I think it, it will, yes. She'll have to make more adjustments. She'll have to be more careful. And had to tread more carefully, because then you must remember it was a mixed society then. There were Hindus and Sikhs and Muslims, and we had all kinds of friends. And there was no enmity, uh, obvious enmity. Uh, and now she will have to be she will have to be Muslim. There's no choice. I won't say it would be hard, but she'll have to be sort of coached in the way to live and so on and so forth. If she wants to make it work, and she obviously does want to make it work, what advice would you give her? What does she do? Well, she has this lovely hospital which has gone up. She can take a really true interest in that. This will really please people. And um, uh, she can show that she really enjoys being here, make friends, not with these sort of necessarily... Uh, elite, but with the average people, the people that come to the hospital. She can do work there also, there's no doubt about it. She can be very useful there, as long as she learns the language. Because what Imran has done is something magnificent in this short time. He's done it really on his own. And um, there she can be very useful. The British papers who've been out here and had a look at Lahore, where Jamal is going to live, have said it's a dirty, smelly city, that women have a terrible life, that she'll be more or less chained up and in the dark. Ridiculous. I think women have a terrible time in many countries, not only in Pakistan, but um, they're not chained up at all. 
the, wearing the burqa now is sort of going out and sometimes the husband insists in, with his own people that she wears a burqa or a pipada. But women are out at work now and they are demanding freedom and they are demanding education. And she will see for herself when she comes here. You don't see many people on the street because nowadays there is a little bit of, well, people, girls are, women are a little bit uh, sort of um, afraid to go out alone. They like a man to be with them if possible. But you, unfortunately, you don't find if a girl is being um, uh, accosted or anything, you don't find men stand up for her on the street. That you don't find. She has to look after herself. So chivalry is not... Well, I think that it's not a question of chivalry. It's a question of um, uh, what will other people say if I stand up for this woman who doesn't belong to me, sort of thing. Will she be? Will you mind be able to go out, party, have a good time, have the sort of social life she might have now in London? No, that doesn't exist here. I mean, that kind of life doesn't exist here, but there are plenty of parties. She will make her own friendly groups and have parties. And parties aren't everything. I mean, you invite people to the house, you have a dinner, you have a chat, you have some music. You make a party sound as though it's a sort of madhouse, but it's nothing like that here. The young people have their parties and thoroughly enjoy them. I mean, my grandson, has, they have their parties. But um, uh, you have to be careful. But uh, she is, she is, she is married to a man of um, importance, and um, parties would be something very pleasant, I think, with him around. I like to be at a party with him around. <laughs> but these will be tea parties? Yes. <laughs> there won't be champagne parties? No, there won't. <laughs> Thank you.